So what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the conspiracy to kill Jesus Christ. The conspiracy that there was to kill Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very simple subject, very simple doctrine, but it's an important one to understand because we're going to be getting into a few other passages in order to really understand what's going on in what Je in, in how Jesus responds and the way that he responds to people. It's important to understand the context that Jesus was being, that, you know, it was being planned that Jesus was going to be murdered. That people were out to kill Jesus Christ. And I know this sounds very sad. And to anyone who's read their Bible, this is, of course, people are out to kill Jesus Christ. But Christianity today has become so weird and ignorant and watered down on so many different subjects that it's almost like people have forgotten that when Jesus Christ was out teaching and preaching and going out in the streets and healing people, while he did have followers, while people were interested in hearing from him and, and he was doing these great works, there were a lot of people that hated him and were trying to get him killed, trying to get him put to death. They're setting traps for him where he went and that this was a big part of the life of Jesus Christ. The picture that, that modern Christianity is going to paint for you is the gentle, long-haired, hippie-looking type of a Jesus sitting on a rock, right, with all the little children sitting in front of him, and he'll have his hands up like this or something, right? Like that would be, if it was a Catholic painting, it would, he'd, he'd be putting up some weird gang signs and, um, you know, flashing whatever, whatever uh, set he's from. But um, the, these pictures... They, they don't do Jesus justice at all. They're not, it's, it's not representative of the life of Jesus Christ. Now look, he did do a lot of teaching. He did help a lot of people, and, and, there, and, and it was great, right? And he didn't go around you know, looking to get into fights. He wasn't a brawl or anything like that. But the words that he said were inflammatory to the point to where people wanted to kill him. If you had a chance to listen to that, that radio show I, I, was, I was interviewed for uh, just this past week, and um, public radio did an interview, they called me in and asked some questions. And one of the questions was they asked me about some other church and some other pastor who has spoken out against uh, the homosexuals, right? And I couldn't answer the question just because I wasn't, I'm not familiar with the church. I don't know who the pastor is or anything. But they said, well, why do you think that you guys are being labeled as hate speech and everything else when this guy said basically the same thing or he's spoken out against the sodomites? You know, like, like what, what do you think is the difference here? And without knowing, and I still don't know exactly what he said, but I said, you know, maybe whatever he said probably wasn't as inflammatory just, you know, the way that he said it or whatever, it didn't, it didn't strike a chord or strike a nerve with people to, for, to the point where they're going to sit, that where it really riles people up and gets them upset. And I bet you he didn't go as far as to saying that I believe that according to God's word that these people ought to be put to death. I mean, that, that's, and really that is what gets people so upset. That is what gets people the most upset. I think that's even more upsetting to people than, you know, and, and, and just for the record, because I've heard them, they bleep out what I, what I said in that sermon, and everyone who is here knows what I said, and it's published online, but the way they bleeped it out sounds really bad. They make it sound like I said a four-letter word when I said a three-letter word. When I was talking about the, the sodomite parade, I said they're fag flags. Okay, that's the word that I used, but the way they bleeped it out, they bleeped out fag and it sounded like a different F word, which that, I mean, everyone here knows that that's not the case, but it just, uh, that was pretty irritating because that's what, what it sounded like and that is not at all what I said. And, and I'd be way more embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed of saying the word fag, but the other word I wouldn't want, you know, that's inappropriate. That wouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be used at all. But um, 
but that's not what I said. <laughs> I said fag flags. But I don't think that that's, even though they had to bleep that out, I don't think that the, the you know, majority of people would be that upset and up in arms about me using that word, right? I mean, I know maybe some people might get a little offended about that, but what really gets people going is I believe they should be put to death because I believe it's that wicked and that sinful. That's what gets people really upset. And you know why? Because it's the word of God. When, you, when you're preaching and teaching the word of God in its entirety, I mean, 100, not just saying it's a sin, it's wrong, Right, that doesn't upset people. You could say all kinds, oh, this is, it's just a sin. But we're all sinners and, you know, and, try, to, and try to sugarcoat it and just, and just really downplay it. Just say, oh, it's really not that bad. It's, you know. well, no, it is that bad. And you know, we ought to be screaming about all of the sins that are abominable, that are that bad, that deserve, you know. It's all really bad. But homosexuality, sodomy, queerness, faggotry, it, it's really bad. That's why I'm using words that might be offensive to people because it's that bad, because I'm not here trying to sugarcoat anything. We don't want to have a soft spot for something extremely abominable. When God rains fire and brimstone down upon a place and destroys it utterly and just says, nope, I'm just completely done with this. We're not sending the angels in to preach the gospel to him. We're going and getting the one righteous guy out of that city so I could destroy everybody in it. I think that says something about the severity and the wickedness of, of what they were doing there. Yeah. That is where people get really upset. And that is what Jesus Christ basically was pretty much saying, oh, Jesus never said anything about, you know. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the embodiment of the word. So, you know, if you're going to say that Christianity should only revolve around the red letters in the Bible, you're ridiculous. You're not a Christian at all. Nobody believes like that except for people who want to throw out the parts of the Bible that they don't agree with. And it's funny because these same people are like, oh, you just pick and choose what you want to believe. No, we believe all of it. You're the one that's picking and choosing what you want to believe. You want to make up doctrines based on the absence of something instead of taking the scripture, the holy word of God in its entirety. But the Bible says in here, in, Gen in John chapter 7, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is all way ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. It sounds like the world hated Jesus Christ. Now, was he just paranoid? Oh, people are out to get me. People hate me. No. He knew what was going on. And the world hated him. And you know what? When the world hates you, they'll probably think that he was hateful. I, I would bet you that they would consider today, if Jesus Christ were preaching today, walking up and down the streets, doing what he does, preaching, going into churches, they would label Jesus Christ a hate preacher. Why? He tells, he tells us why he was hated. He says, but me it hateth because I testify of it, of the world, that the works thereof are evil. He called out sin. He called out the works of the world being evil. And as I mentioned before, if he just said, well, this is a sin or that's a sin and just said it like that, but we're all sinners, who hates that person? Nobody does. I guarantee Jesus was a preacher of righteousness. And the reason why he was hated is because he testified of the world, the works are ever evil. Now, going back a little bit about Jesus Christ and the conspiracy to kill Jesus, you know, people today like to throw around the term, you know, conspiracy theorist, right? Whenever they want to make it, it's, it's become this, this label to just eliminate the credibility of the truthfulness of what somebody's saying because they don't believe it to be true and they want you to sound like you're crazy. So they say, well, you're just some conspiracy theorist. As if any time there's a conspiracy, you're just a nut 
for saying there is a conspiracy. People these days have, have used that. You just, even just the word conspiracy, if you say something is a conspiracy, people are going to already start thinking like, you're crazy, you're nuts, there's no conspiracy, nothing to see here, everything's fine. No, no one exists that has any evil intent. There's nobody that has bad plans against anybody else. No one conspires against people. You're just nuts. Well, I'm sorry, but that is a very, very ignorant, foolish, stupid position to take if you think there are no bad people that plan to do harm to other people, first of all. Or if you think, oh, well, they would never be in these honorable positions or people in our politicians. <laughs> Yeah, they, they would never plan on doing anything evil, right? Because they're all saints. They're all, they're all really good, godly people, church-going Christians that live these really moral lives, right? Isn't that, isn't that what all the politicians do? Aren't they the model of what we should be as people because they live such a righteous life? Oh, yeah, wait. We're on the planet Earth in the United States of America. I, I, let me get back to, to reality here. No, of course, these people are not, are, it's not some stretch to say that there are wicked men that conspire. And, and if you want to call someone a conspiracy theorist, okay, yeah, there, there's theories about the way that men conspire because they are, there's a lot of people that conspire to do bad things. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's the, the way that propaganda works, and this isn't a sermon about propaganda, but... Um, the, the, the brainwashing and mind control that goes on is amazing. And the impact that it has, you know, I preached on this when it came to hate speech. Just the label hate speech. So many people now have just accepted that it's even a thing. Like it's just, oh yeah, hate speech. Oh, you hate speech? Oh, you have a hate group? Oh, you know, and it's just, it's just this label that gets stuck that really is pretty meaningless. Um, so people would probably call, they even were basically saying that Jesus Christ was crazy. When he said, you know, there's people out to kill me. And there were some people at the time going, you're crazy, you have a devil, who's going about to kill you, right? We see this in John chapter 7. Now John chapter 7 verse 1 says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. So we have an example, he's saying he's, he's teaching and preaching, excuse me, and, and doing his thing in Galilee because he didn't want to walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So he's avoiding the area where they have it out for him to put him to death because his time has not yet come. He explains why they hated him because the works are of evil. Look to, down to verse number 16 now. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Amen. I mean, this is exactly what we teach and we believe here. You know, oh, you hate group. You just hate the Sodomites because they're different from you. No, the doctrine is not mine. The doctrine comes from the word of God. It's not, it, it, what I'm teaching isn't just, oh, you're different from me, so I don't like you. Yeah, because in every other area of my life, that, I'm just against everyone who's different from me. No, because I'm against perverts. Because I'm against what God is against. But people want to just justify things and, and simplify it in their own minds to be able to rationalize and accept it. Uh, without accepting the truth. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? So now he's just, why do you guys want to kill me so bad? You know, I'm preaching, I, my doctrine isn't mine, my doctrine is, is of God. You know, if anyone's doing the truth, you're going to know that this doctrine's of God. He says, didn't Lo Moses give you the law? You know, because they always wanted to claim and believing in Moses. He says, none of you keep it. None of you keep the law, then why do you want to kill me? Look at verse 20, it says, the people answered and said, thou hast the devil who goeth about to kill thee. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're possessed. You're just saying that people want to go out to kill isn't that the same thing that people say, oh, there's no conspiracy. Oh, you're nuts. You're crazy. Here's your tinfoil head, Jesus. Yeah, now who's going about to kill you? And downplay it and try to cover up that there's nothing really going on. Was there something really going on? <laughs> yeah, you better believe it. Uh, Jesus was actually nailed to the cross 
For those of you who didn't read or know what happened to Jesus, there, there was a conspiracy to kill him. They did conspire with people. They did send people out to catch him in his words. They did, you know, hire Judas to betray him and to turn him over to them so that they could arrest him and crucify him because they had a hard time doing that. They hired people against him. They tried to find false witnesses to lie about him. They tried to set him up. They did set him up. And they executed him. That's a conspiracy fact. That's not just a theory. It was going on. And at the time when Jesus is confronting him about it, he said, why are you trying to kill me? Oh, no one's trying to kill you. Let's keep reading here. Verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work and y'all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. And you're angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? The other people knew it too. They're like, isn't this the guy that they want to kill? And they're saying he's speaking boldly in the temple. It wasn't just Jesus that was spouting off these crazy theories. A lot of everyone knew what was going on. They knew. They, just, they were afraid to say it. They didn't want to say it. And the ones who were evil and wicked were the ones going, oh, no, there's nothing to see here. There's no conspiracy. No one's trying to kill you. There's lots of evidence in the scripture, though. I'm just going to read some of these for you. Look at, uh, turn to John chapter 11. You're in John chapter 7 anyways. I'm going to read Matthew 26 for you. Matthew 26, 14 says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Judas Iscariot was hired for thirty pieces of silver to betray Jesus Christ. There was a conspiracy going. He talked to the chief priests. They were behind it. John chapter 11, look at verse 46. The Bible says, But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. This is when Jesus is performing miracles. And a lot of people believed on him, but some people just had to go and rat him out for doing good deeds. Like, do you know that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath? Do you know that, you know? And that was one of their big things, too. That, that really infuriated them was Jesus Christ doing good, healing people on the Sabbath day. But uh, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we for this man doeth many miracles? So what's a council? There's a group of people now being gathered together. A bunch of people who all believe, who all hate Jesus Christ, and are saying, What are we going to do about this guy? That sounds like a conspiracy. It sounds like they're coming together with a plan. What are we going to do to him? And taking counsel together. What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So if we don't do something about this, then we're going to be, we're going to lose our power. We're going to be displaced because everyone's going to believe him. And then what's going to happen to us? And this is the way people in power act. The corrupt politicians, they want to stay in power and they will bite and devour and conspire and do whatever they can to try to hold on to that power. Anytime they think that there's a threat to their power, that's, this is how they respond. Verse number 49, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. This is a really interesting event. I'm not going to get into this very much, but basically Caiaphas is, is being used of God to deliver God's word because he's the high priest, even though he's there trying to conspire against Jesus Christ. Now, what, when I read this, what, what I bet you was going on in the minds of everyone else, though, because this is the word of God, and what's being taught is that Jesus Christ was going to die for, for the whole world. That's what the Bible explains to us, is the purpose that he was, he spake that by the Holy Ghost to, um, you know, that, that he spake this scripture. But I bet you everyone else there was thinking like, yeah, it's expedient for us 
like we need to kill this guy it's going to be in our best interest to get rid of this guy so that we don't lose the power that we have over the nation completely obviously eyes being blinded to what the actual truth of the statement is about but not even catching on because it kind of could fit in with their with their plans to to destroy him and then it says in verse 53 then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death again just more evidence of this conspiracy um, turn to Luke chapter 11 Luke chapter 11 I'm going to give you one more piece of evidence this is all common place in scripture I'm just bringing up a few more areas here about this conspiracy and then I'm going to get into kind of more of the the reason why I'm going into so much detail about this and laying such a, a heavy groundwork Matthew 12 9 says and when he was departed thence he went into the synagogue and behold there was a man which had his hand withered and they asked him saying is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him we're gonna see this many times throughout scriptures people who are disingenuous come to Jesus Christ and they try to trap him they try to catch him in his words they want to make an accusation against Jesus Christ which is why they said hey is it lawful to heal because they thought you couldn't do anything on the Sabbath days their understanding of keeping the Sabbath was that you can't heal you can't do anything for people they were wrong about that Jesus Christ was trying to set them straight on that saying hey and that's why we saw in John chapter 7 he, um, you know you circumcise somebody you do the work involved of performing a circumcision if it happens to be on a Sabbath day because it's eight days after a male child is born that you circumcise them and obviously sometimes that's gonna fall on a Saturday it's gonna fall on the Sabbath so he says well in order to keep the law you do the circumcision on the Sabbath don't you if you're able to do that if you're able to keep that commandment and that you're not breaking the Sabbath by doing that how in the world can you say I'm breaking the Sabbath by making somebody whole by making them complete by by healing their 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 pain their problem by by making them oh that's breaking the Sabbath somehow and he's pointing out their hypocrisy and their error in, in, in any understanding of Scripture. But I mean, the reason why they didn't understand the Scripture is because they weren't saved. The people who were saved had no problem understanding and accepting this concept. That's why when his he was with his disciples and they pulled the ears of corn and they ate them as they were serving the Lord and working for God and preaching the gospel to people, they weren't breaking the Sabbath in what they were doing. Um, they, had that they, had, they had that understanding, but these people didn't. Now, but, but without even getting involved with all the Sabbath day teaching, what I'm really going to point out here is just they're asking him a question because they want to accuse him. That was the purpose of their question. They just wanted to be able to bring an accusation against Jesus Christ in order to have something against him, in order to destroy him. That was their intent. Verse 11 says, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. And he explains, look, you hypocrites, if one of your ox, one of your sheep, you have some, you know, one of your animals falls into a ditch and it's a Sabbath day, you know you're going to go over there and, and get that animal out. And he's not saying there's a problem with that. What he's saying, though, is that now you have people. I mean, how much better is a person than an animal? But see, they love their animals more than they love people because they're willing to help their animals and not the people. Right. Oh, no, no, you can suffer over there, but my sheep, my property, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help this not to be uh, destroyed or not to die on, on the Sabbath day. And um, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Then, then verse 13 says, Then said he, Saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. Again, a council is being brought together. How are we going to destroy Jesus Christ? This isn't all of the references. These are just a few, because I didn't want to just go on and on and on and have the entire sermon just going through all the Gospels, just showing how many times 
that there are people conspiring against Jesus Christ. But it's important to have this understanding when we go through some of the teachings in Scripture of what is going on. What is going on behind the scenes? There are people trying to trap him. Now, if you had someone hanging on your words, trying to find a fault with you, and you know that this is going on, and you know there are people that just want you to get arrested, they just want to bring an accusation against you, don't you think you're going to be a little careful with what you say? Aren't you going to try to spend a little bit more time probably thinking about well, whatever I say needs to be said well and right and proper so that they don't, they can't attack me falsely. It's, I mean, think about when you see a cop pull out behind you on the road and you're driving, what do you do? Make sure I'm using blinkers, I'm driving right, I'm, you know, why? Because you don't want to get pulled over. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh man, someone's watching me, I got to, you know, make sure I'm doing everything right. This is the way it was with that, how they were on Jesus Christ. So he had to make sure that what he said, I mean, obviously he's the son of God. It's not like he's being flippant with his speech anyways. But just to understand what, you know, what people are trying to do to him, you got to understand this. And it wasn't like that everywhere he went. I mean, there's plenty of times he's preaching to his disciples, you know, or he's, you know, he's, he's teaching other people, um, And I, I don't want to say, you could say he's being a little bit more forthcoming, a little bit more open and not speaking in parables or not speaking in dark sayings. He's revealed more unto his disciples. But um, this is definitely going on. You're in Luke chapter 11. Look at verse number 53. We see one more example of this. The Bible says, And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So what they're trying to, they, they start just bombarding him, asking about all kinds of things, just trying to confuse him, trying to just get him talking and that hoping that if we just get him talking enough about something, now we could accuse him of something. These aren't genuine people asking sincere questions, looking for answers. They're trying to destroy Jesus. And this is one of their traps that they're trying to set for him by saying, hey, let's just get him talking. Well, in so doing, think about this, you know, they're, they're using a way, they're actually using something that's, that would be considered a, a, a good trap, right? A way to, to get people to sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. I mean, even the Proverbs say, hey, if you just keep running your mouth, you're going you're gonna to end up sinning. You're going to end up just, just saying something wrong or whatever because you're just letting your, your mouth just go and just, just keep on going. We need to be careful about that. And we need to understand, one, that people are going to try to lay traps. They laid traps for Jesus Christ. They're going to lay traps for those that follow Jesus Christ. This is why when you deal with people who are just trying to, trying to find anything, try to catch something in what you say, you got to be careful with what you say. And even, you know, I try to be very careful with my responses when people ask me questions that are not you know, genuine questions of someone who's actually interested in hearing what the Bible says or hearing what I believe and just actually, you know, care about that, but just want to set a trap. Everyone needs to be aware of this. Now, one last point before I get into these two examples in Scripture that are, that are both oftentimes very uh, just taken out of context and not understood correctly. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. There's one more point I want to make. And again, this is only one place in Scripture. It talks about this, but there's multiple places where you get the same teaching. And the teaching we're looking at here in 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we as believers, and according to Scripture, we should be trying to do everything according to the law, the law of the land, the law that exists. Of course, only to the extent that it doesn't contradict with God's laws, 
But in general, we're supposed to just live peaceably as much as we possibly can with all men, follow the rules, just, you know, do what we can. But, um, you know, w w within, within the realm of, of authority that God has given to the government to, to obey what we're supposed to obey and, and to um, not just take the law into our own hands and do things like that. So we find this here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, ab abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So here you have Gentiles that are speaking evil against people of God. Where he's saying they're, they're speaking evil against you as if you're some evildoer, you're a wicked person, you know, there's bringing accusations, lies, whatever, speaking bad about you. You're saying, well, you just better have good works then. Just show them that what they're saying isn't true. Don't give them any occasion to be able to speak falsely against you. And then verse 13 says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty as for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Basically, you know, we don't need to give anybody any extra reasons to speak evil against us. And you know, follow the commands. We don't have a king, but of the governors or, you know, whatever, you know, authorities there. And again, this isn't uh, in anything that would contradict God's law. And I don't want to get into all the details of this, but in general, there's a teaching that's basically saying, be wise, you know, don't give anybody opportunity to say bad things against you because you're using your liberty um, you know, it says as free, but not using your liberty as a, for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. We know that we're free in many things, but we don't have to just go around and start breaking a bunch of rules just to, just to, um, just because. But um, turn to Matthew 22. Because one of the ways they're going to try, people are going to try to trap you or the way that they tried to trap Jesus Christ is by using the law. And this is the way that they tried to, to trap Daniel. So remember the book of Daniel. Read the book of Daniel. Daniel lived an upright life. He was a great man and, and he was exalted to a position of power. And the other people that were in positions of power, but they were a little bit lower than Daniel, they wanted Daniel's spot. They coveted his position. They didn't like Daniel. So they tried to find ways to get him brought down. They tried to find, oh, where is he, you know, where is he failing? Where, you know, they wanted to accuse him unto the king, and they couldn't do it because he was living uprightly. He was doing what was right. He was following the rules. He was doing his job. They couldn't find anything to pin against Daniel. So they had to come up with some new law that would contradict God's law in order just to find something to accuse him of. Now, Daniel did the right thing when it came to a, con a conflict between man's law and God's law. He said, well, I'm going to obey God rather than men. When they said you can't pray unless you ask for permission, he just kept praying anyways because he's not going to go and ask for permission to pray to something that, that God wouldn't want him to do just to go seek, you know, to, to go through man before you go to God. Uh, -uh. So, um, but that was the only way they were able to, to set a trap for him. Well, similarly, people were trying to set traps for Jesus by using the law at the time, by using the law of the Roman government that had the authority over the land to try to get Jesus Christ to be in conflict with that law. Here's one example that we see in Matthew 22, verse number 15. This is in regards to basically it's in regards to paying taxes. Okay. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. 
Again, another reference. They're trying to entangle him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to get Jesus to say something in order to accuse him. That is the purpose here in, verse, in Matthew 22. Look at verse 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God and truth. And look at how they butter him up. That they send out their, their minions, right? Their false prophets, their disciples unto Jesus Christ. Oh, we know that you have the words of truth. We know that you are such a wise master that you, you know, we just want to know from you. Disingenuous, okay, flattering, trying to flatter Jesus Christ to get him to open up to say something that would condemn him according to the Roman government law. So he said, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God and truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. And, and they're, again, they're trying to lead him into saying, see, look, you don't care what man thinks, right? So you're not going to care what the, the king thinks, right? So, so yeah, just tell us that we don't have to pay our taxes because you don't care what any man says. You're just going to tell us the truth. This is what they're trying to lead him into doing. Verse 17, tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? That's our question. Is it lawful? Is it right? Should we be giving tribute, paying money, giving tribute, tax money to Caesar or not? Verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So Jesus knew right off the gate their intention was not good. They didn't really want to know the answer to that question. It was purposely crafted to try to get him to say something that was going to be in conflict either with the law or with the word of God. One or the other. He, because if they could catch him, they're trying to get a catch-22. They're trying to make him answer a question that no matter how he answers it, is going to be wrong. They're going to be able to say, well, we could accuse you now because you're speaking against the word of God, or we can accuse you now because you're speaking against the Roman government. Like, like one way or the other, they're trying to just catch him in order to get him arrested or, or um, you know, put him to death. So in this situation, he, Jesus answers them very wisely. He gives them an answer so that he's not in conflict with anything it says in verse 19 show me the tribute money and they brought unto him a penny and he saith unto them whose is this image and superscription they say unto him caesar's then saith the unto them render therefore unto caesar the things which are caesar's and unto god the things that are god's when they had heard these words they marveled and left him and went their way so he didn't say don't pay anything to to see you know don't pay tribute to caesar he didn't say that Now, even though he gave that answer and they couldn't trap him in his words, they still try to use this to accuse him when he's getting arrested. Uh, turn to Matthew 17, but in Luke 23, verse 1, the Bible reads, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now, was Jesus forbidding to give tribute to Caesar? Nope. But you know what? They said it anyways. They lied about him. But this is what they were trying to get him to say when they, when they asked the question. Because they're trying to trap him in his words. They're trying to have something to lay against him. Now, that one couldn't stick. He didn't teach that. But in Matthew 17, we're going to see how Jesus actually feels about this, about what's right and what's wrong. Because Jesus didn't think that he had to pay tribute unto Caesar. This is why they're asking him the question. Look at uh, verse 24. The Bible says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money. And again, there's, and I'm not going to go into all the differences, but when it came to like the taxation, there's customs and duties and tribute money. There, there's different purposes behind the different taxes. Right. So paying tribute to Caesar was a different type of tax than like a sales tax. OK, there's 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 different. And, and we're not going to go into all those details. It doesn't really matter. But 
he's giving an explanation here, though, of, of even them as Jews, they, they shouldn't have to pay tribute unto Caesar. Look at verse number, uh, so in, in verse 24, the people that received, the tax collectors that received the tribute money came to Peter and they're like, hey, doesn't your master pay tribute? And he didn't know how to answer. He's just like, uh, yeah, uh, sure. You know, verse 25, he saith, yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? So just in general, kings of the earth, people who really, you know, don't they normally take custom or take these cat, you know, take this tribute from foreign countries, not from their own, not from their own citizens, their own children, right? He just asked him, how, uh, isn't that how it works? Peter saith unto him, of strangers, right? So yeah, of, of foreigners, of other people, that's who pays that tribute money. That's who this tax should be applied to. Jesus said unto him, then are the children free. So we shouldn't have to pay this. And you know what? I bet you that was the common understanding by a lot of people at that time, that this wasn't unique to Jesus, that he's the only one that thought this way. That's why they're asking him, hey, should we pay tribute to Caesar? Because none of them thought that you should pay tribute to Caesar, but no one wanted to say that because they were afraid of the government. They were afraid of what's going to happen if someone says, yeah, I mean, of course we shouldn't pay tribute because it's, that should be exacted on strangers, not on the people of the land. So when Jesus is speaking with Peter, he's explaining that to him. But when they ask him about it, you know, he doesn't need, there, there, that's not his fight. That's not why he's here is just to correct the government on taxation. So he doesn't need to just go on that crusade and answer those people's question, which they are trying to trap him anyways. So he just answers them wisely and says, hey, we have render unto Caesar after Caesar, render unto God that which is God's. Wise answer. He's not saying what's right or wrong. He's just saying, well, there you go. Because, and anyways, and there's a lot of things you could learn from that, from, that, from his one statement anyways, just about the, you know, the meaning of money. Any, you know, like, it's all going to burn up. Who cares? Right? You know, whose image and superstition? That's Caesar. It's, he's got his name printed on this money and stuff. Yeah, give that to him. Who cares? That's not what this world's about. But, um, but in then verse 27 here, when he's dealing with Peter, because they ask Peter, hey, does your master pay tribute? He's like, yeah. So he goes back. Jesus corrects him and says, you know what? We don't really need to pay this. But what does he do anyways? He pays it. Verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast and hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. There you go. Just give them their stupid money. And this is while, while I agree and sympathize with all the tax protesters, you know, we shouldn't be paying income tax, stuff like that. I agree with that. But I'm also going to pay my taxes. Because I don't think that's a fight that's worth going to jail over when I've got other work to do. I've got other things that God wants me to do that are way more important than that. And their money can perish with them. I, it doesn't mean I like it. It doesn't mean I agree with it. it doesn't, you know, but I'm not going to give them and you know, people who want to trap me and send me to jail so that I can't do the work of the Lord so that we can't have this church or we can't, you know, that, that want to destroy things. I'm not going to give them that opportunity. It's not worth it. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. All of that is groundwork for understanding John chapter 8. Because this is what I wasn't able to get to last week. One of the most common misconceptions of Scripture but it's important to see all of the other framework and just the, how the New Testament works and how people are trying to attack Jesus when we understand John chapter 8 with the woman taken in adultery. Because just like we saw, they're trying to trap Jesus in his words. They're trying to entangle him. They're trying to ask him a question to which there is no right answer. There's no way that he could get out of it. This is the motivation. This is what they're trying to do. There was a conspiracy against Jesus Christ to have him killed. 
Now, let's under, with this understanding, read what John chapter 8 is talking about. Look at verse number 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now, are they right about what the law says there? I believe so. I think that that's what the law says. The woman taken in adultery, she ought to be put to death. Amen. But did they do this because they really wanted to understand the law? <laughs> were, they, were they really asking, well, should we put them to death? I mean, I, that's what I, the way I read the law. Am I reading this right? That's not what they're trying to do. Because the next verse says, in verse 6, it says, This they said, tempting him. They're testing him. That they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger rolled on the ground as though he heard them not. So they're asking him a foolish question. And his first way to deal with this is just to ignore him. Say, I'm not going to deal with your nonsense. I'm not going to fall for your traps because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to trap him. Now, how are they trying to trap him? Keep your finger here in John 8. Flip over to John 18. You say, what would be the big deal about Jesus Christ saying, well, yeah, she should be put to death, right? What you have to understand is that, and at this time, the Jews... We already saw the passage that said they were worried about their power being taken away and that the Romans were going to come in and, and take their kingdom from their power. Under the Roman government, there were different regions that had their own, you know, authority structure. It all fell under, you know, the big Roman Empire. But you had different rulers and leaders. And in the Jews, in Israel here, they were able to have their own laws that they enforced and and you know the roman government allowed them to do that but there were restrictions on the types of laws that they could have one of those restrictions john 18 verse 31 this this is evident this is a fact this isn't just even looking at history books of of knowing the laws of the time john 18 31 says then said Pilate unto them take ye him and judge him according to your law when, when they were accusing Jesus Christ, when he was brought to Pilate, he says, well, just judge him according to your law then. Why? Because he knew that they had a law. He knew that they had authority to, to pronounce judgment upon people according to their law. And he said, well, then just deal with them. Why are you bringing them to me? Deal with them according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So they had the authority to have their own laws and to judge people and to do what they needed to do to govern their own area. But they were not allowed to, to condemn somebody to death. That was something that the Roman government said, nope, we're, you do not have that authority to do that. That has to go under Roman law. So back to John chapter 8. So John 18, 31, th that is very clear there. They themselves, the people who wanted to put Jesus to death, are the ones saying, we don't have the authority to do this. So when they bring this woman taken in adultery, that according to God's law, deserves the death penalty, they go to Jesus. They're already saying, oh, he's, he's saying he's this king and he's got a kingdom and, and he's going against the authority of Caesar. And, you know, th this is what they're trying to portray Jesus as. If he says... Well, that's what the law says. She should be put to death. They're going to do that. They're going to put this woman to death and say, well, Jesus said to do it. And then put him in conflict with the Roman government law. So that way they could say, no, 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 you can't usurp the authority of the Roman government law. We're going to, you know. And that way they win. But then if he says, no, she shouldn't be put to death. Well, what does Moses, what does the law of Moses say? You see how, how they, they put him in this position. 
to try to make it so that he can't answer them without them having some way to accuse him. But what people do today will look at this story and say, well, yeah, in the Old Testament, there used to be, a, you know, adultery was, was given to death, but now in the New Testament, you know, that's not the case anymore. Because, because look at what happened here with Jesus, you know. He that's without sin among you cast the first stone. So that's, I mean, that's it. So we should have no more death penalty. It doesn't matter anymore. No, no, how about we understand the whole context of what's going on in the scripture and what they're trying to do to him and why he answers the way he answers. Amen. We saw the way that he answered about the tax thing and we saw the way that, that he really felt about it. His answer to them was a little bit different because he was dealing with that situation than just coming out and just stating what should be the way it is. They're two different things. But let's even look at the words of Jesus. Look at verse number seven. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Did he say she doesn't deserve to be put to death? Is that what he said? Were those the words of Jesus Christ? We're going to look at his words. Did he say, well, she shouldn't be put to death then? No. Absolutely. In fact, I think he said the opposite. I think he pronounced a death penalty. Now, he did so in a very wise way. And there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot of teaching here. He's convicting them of their own sin. They were hypocritical judges. They were trying to get someone else put to death when they're trying to get him put to death. Okay, they're guilty of what they're trying to condemn someone else for. They had no place to judge at all. And he's making this abundantly clear to them through what he's saying. And, and But that was his answer. This is a one-sentence response. This isn't, you know, this great teaching on the Old Testament law because we can look at other places where he says, I came not to destroy the law or the prophets. So I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. He says, and, and, and no wise shall one jot or one tittle fail from the law till all be fulfilled. Amen. So when, when you take the Bible in context and you could look at all the teachings, then you could get your full understanding. What is he saying here? But you know what? That's a little bit too much work for Christians these days. They want the feel-good message. They want to say, oh, well, adultery apparently isn't really that bad because of the woman taking adultery that didn't get put to death. That all of a sudden now it's really not as bad of a sin as it was in the Old Testament and that Jesus is, is okay with it now. That's what you're going to walk away with in the vast majority of churches these days because of their complete ignorance on Scripture, on what the Bible says, and what Jesus even said here. And most people that will reference this story they don't even know how Jesus responded. They can't tell you what he actually said. They just know what they've heard preached over and over and over again. Oh, see, we can't judge. We can't throw any, we can't judge anything because of this story. When in fact, this just supports every other teaching about judging in the Bible, which is to judge righteously, not to be a hypocrite when you judge this is one more example of the same exact teaching because they were hypocrites trying to put someone else to death when they themselves were trying to put Jesus Christ to death. And you know what? The Bible teaches that when someone is going to bring a false report or be a false witness against somebody, that whatever crime they're trying to convict them of, if they're lying about that, that they deserve that punishment. Yeah. So all the false witnesses that wanted to tell, you know, say how Jesus was doing things worthy of death, they actually deserve the death penalty according to the law. Which is another reason why that they're just totally hypocritical in them trying to bring judgment upon someone else. Especially the death penalty judgment. They've got a big old beam in their eye. But let's finish the story here. It says, um, and again, he stooped down, wrote on the ground, verse number nine, 
And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now, a couple more things about this story. So we're almost done. When Jesus came to this earth the first time, when he's walking around the earth here, what was his mission here? His mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. He came to, to you know, the, as the son, of, the son of God and the Son of Man. He came to bear the sins of the whole world. He came to save people. Jesus came to die and to pay for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's why he came. He didn't come to be the King of kings and Lord of lords and to sit on his throne and to judge the nations. That wasn't his purpose. So why would he start by judging people here with this woman taking adultery? That's not why he came. It doesn't mean he wouldn't have been right in saying that she deserved the death penalty, which he basically did, but that's not why he came. Now he's coming back. And he's coming back to set up a throne. And you better believe that it's going to be the law of God that's going to be enacted on earth for a thousand years while Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. Yeah. It's not going to be some random man's law that is totally flawed, that is backwards in many areas and just say, well, we're just going to leave. No, he's going to come to set things right and say, this is how things are supposed to be. And we're going to get a thousand years of a ruling and reigning and, and serving under Jesus Christ who's ruling and reigning. This is how the world was supposed to be. This is how everything was supposed to be. God being the king. And he's going to have people, I believe, judging and ruling and reigning with him. That's what the Bible says. There will be other judges, but you know who's going to be reigning supreme? God will be. He didn't come to put people to death. He came to save people. He's coming back to reign. When he's left alone now with the woman, after everybody left and went out because they were convicted by their own conscience, it says in verse 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. There is nothing that he said or did that contradicts the law of God here. The law of Moses, as, as they refer to it as. In order for someone to be put to death, you need to have two or three witnesses. Right? Right? Now, they came out at first with the accusation, but the whole point of, you know, in the way that, that God's law was supposed to be done, it wasn't just mob rule. There's supposed to be, you know, a judge that's going to hear the matter and judge appropriately. Well, if you have nobody condemning something, they all left. They all retracted their statements then and just and, and went away. So now you've just got this woman who initially had been accused, but there's nobody willing to stand up and testify against her because they all left. How can Jesus now say, well, you still are going to be put to death? Not according to the law of Moses that was enacted to be in, in effect at that time. But also, he wasn't coming to condemn people. He was coming to save them. And yes, even an adulterer or an adulteress can be saved. It's not like they blasphemed the Holy Ghost. He came to save souls. But just whether it be this teaching or any other one, there's a huge difference between somebody's soul being saved and the laws that we ought to have governing our society. Just because something's a crime doesn't mean that person's soul can't be saved. But just because Jesus Christ died to pay for the sins of the whole world to save their souls from going to hell doesn't mean that we should just abolish all laws. Right. That's right. 
there is a balance. The balance is crimes, laws, punishment on this earth, salvation, eternal life, forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ for your soul. Two different things. Let's not be ignorant of the scripture. You ought not to, to be ignorant believers. There's too many of them today. Take the time to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And be able to answer for why you believe what you believe. You know, we're not, we're not out trying to, to start fights with people. At the same time, we, wa we want believers to be educated. I want, I want anyone who claims the name of Christ to be educated about what the Bible actually says and to not flip out when you hear someone preaching what the Bible actually says because you don't know the Bible, because you're relying on what some man teaches you every Sunday that you go to church instead of actually reading for yourself and, and knowing what does the book actually say? Father, I just have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us all these stories and all the instruction in, in Scripture, Lord. I pray that you please help us to be diligent to study your words, to read them, to, to know them, to memorize them, Lord, um, to, to keep them with us, to be our light unto our path. And we ask for your guidance and that you'd open up our understanding of the Scripture and give us wisdom and knowledge, Lord. Help us to, uh, to instruct others to, to get more disciples, to get more people uh, saved, discipled, and, and out teaching and um, converting more souls to Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us here in the, in the area that, that we've been given here to do this work. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.